Well, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm not really going to talk a lot about production of camelina. I'm going to talk more about the marketing end of the, uh, end of the uh, spectrum. Uh, we'll let uh, Kelly and uh, Tim Danaher talk about the, uh, the farming and the production of camelina and mustard. But uh, <clears throat> my name's Kurt Greenwald. I'm from Ritzville. We, uh, my family, uh, and myself, we run a business called Old World Oils, and we buy camelina, and we process that into a uh, human cooking oil. And I think we are, uh, I'm going to turn my phone off because I just got a message here, so before it starts ringing. Uh, I think we're one of the, the few uh, processors of oil, maybe the only one in the state of Washington that does camelina oil. I, I know there's one in uh, Oregon and there's one in British Columbia, a fairly new processor. Uh, but camelina is a fairly new crop as far as human consumption goes in the United States. That's uh, it really, it's an a ancient crop. It's like uh, 10 years ago, how many of you had heard of ki kiwa? Or how many of you had heard of chia 10 years ago, besides chia pets? And uh, so it falls along those lines, one of those ancient crops that got forgotten about, that got passed over by modern agriculture or modern food processing in some respects, and is now making uh, somewhat of a comeback because of, of uh, health reasons or because of uh, now it's a little more practical than it was um, maybe 90 years ago or 100 years ago. And so uh, camelina, while it's not a, a huge crop right now as far as acres go, uh, Looking down the road, I think the potential is there for it to be a very uh, important crop in the state of Washington and, and the Northwest as a whole. And we'll, <clears throat> we'll try to talk about that a little bit. We, uh, we do farm, and we have raised camelina. We've raised it for four years on our farm. Uh, we farm west of Ritzville in that Mennonite church area, north of the Shrag rest stop. And <clears throat> at one time, they called that God's country, and I believe that is God's country because the only one that really wants that land is God himself. So uh, when uh, my sons, uh, I taught for 30 years, and uh, we raised our family in Palouse, Washington, and then outside of Spango, I taught at Liberty High School for 19 years. And <clears throat> my kids really didn't grow up around Ritzville. They would visit once in a while. And then when uh, I moved back there, my kids were all grown and out of the house, and. Uh, started farming and they'd come help me farm once in a while and uh, I'll never forget my son saying you know <clears throat> after being out here for a day on the farm I have to wonder what my ancestors did that they got put out here to make a living so uh, sometimes that ground can be pretty rough out there <clears throat> but we've been processing camelina for three years now and every year the amount of Camelina we process has increased uh, 350 to 400 percent. And so that uh, is a good indicator for us that uh, it is catching on and that people do like the product and that there is some value and benefit to the product. We, uh, <clears throat> of course, have restraints, government restraints, and those are uh, we can only sell Camelina oil as a single ingredient product. We cannot sell that to be used in another food ingredient. Uh, so the oil that we do sell is strictly uh, the oil we do sell is strictly in, in containers. Uh, we have different size containers, but this is basically how we, how we market the product. We do sell some bulk we have bulk oil that goes to cosmetic places. Um, we have bulk oil that goes to massage parlors. And uh, if you look at, uh, there should be a sheet. You should have some sheets on your table. Uh, you can look at the, one of those sheets, and it's the, it's the oil chart type of oil. And it's got uh, a few different types of common oils there. If you look at uh, camelina, you'll see that the amount of vitamin E in that oil, there's a huge amount of vitamin E. The next closest oil to it is uh, <clears throat> sunflower oil, and it has roughly four times the amount of sunflower, 
four times the amount of vitamin E as sunflower oil, uh, about 12 times the amount of vitamin E as olive oil. And uh, <clears throat> you can, you can uh, just compare that to uh, other products. And vitamin E acts uh, in a lot of ways in that oil. It protects that oil in the bottle from breaking down, as well as uh, there's three different kinds of fats in that oil, which the arrangement of the fats help it from breaking down. Uh, the vitamin E also acts as an antioxidant, so when you cook with it, it's not gonna produce free radicals that some of your other oils do when they get too hot. So the, the, uh, the oil itself is, is a really healthy, really nice product. We sell it as a raw natural product. We don't uh, process this oil. A lot of the oils you buy have no taste and no smell. And so people, when they taste this, some, some people don't like it at first. And the reason is, is because processed oils have all the taste and smell taken out of them, usually a chemical process. This is a, a, a raw natural oil that the way the oil comes out of the seed is the way you get it. And that's a, there's a lot of healthy nutrition in, in the taste of that oil that's taken out by other products. Uh, canola is a lot healthier oil when it's left raw than when it's processed because you lose a lot of micronutrients and phytonutrients, nutrients from sunlight. So <clears throat> uh, getting the oil this way is one way that uh, uh, makes it real healthy. We do a lot of... Uh, demos, that's the only way we, we can really sell our oil. We're in about 85 stores now, and we're uh, getting close to 15, 16 farmers markets around the Northwest. And the only way we sell the oil is by personal contact, by when you talk to somebody and they get to try it. If you go put this on a store shelf, it won't sell at all. But when people try it um, and hear the benefits, uh, they tend to buy it. But we were doing a demo Saturday, as a matter of fact, in Coeur d'Alene at Pilgrim's Natural Foods. And the grocery manager told me that the product in their store that's losing, that's decreasing sales the fastest is fish oil. And fish oil, people buy fish oil because of omega-3s. People are scared of fish oil now because of the uh, results came out last year with prostate cancer and also with the problems in Japan with nuclear waste in the ocean. And so people are really afraid of fish oil. Well, if you look at the oils on there, if you look at the omega-3s and you look at the oils, uh, <clears throat> flax oil has 58% omega-3s, camelino has 35%, and that'll vary a little bit according to environment and where it's raised. Uh, our numbers on that camelina oil came from the University of Idaho, so that's, that's right off of our farm. The uh, difference in, in those omegas, uh, flax oil lasts about six months and has to be refrigerated. Uh, we guarantee our oil a year and a half on the shelf, and I know it'll last longer. That's why we guarantee it a year and a half, because it'll last two or more, uh, and it doesn't have to be refrigerated. So uh, there's some, some health qualities about this oil that I think when the word gets out and it's around for a while, uh, I think this oil will come back into, into uh, existence again. And uh, we're hoping that, uh, of course, we're hoping for business sakes, it becomes very popular. <clears throat> but you can look and compare the qualities across the board with oils, and you'll see that this is a, a very healthy oil. So uh, vitamin E, uh, well, we'll talk, talk a little bit about omegas. I don't know if everybody uh, has to take omegas. Uh, you, sh you should, honestly, but a lot of times doctors tell you you have to take an omega-3 regimen. And omega-3s help decrease inflammation in your body. <clears throat> and so uh, this oil... It's kind of odd in the way it's, it, it, it's regulated by the government. I can sell this oil to humans as a single ingredient product and it's perfectly legal. <clears throat> if I sell it to you, uh, if you come to me and say, I have an animal that's, that I want to give oil to so I, its coat looks better, it doesn't have dandruff, and it's got arthritis and I need to give it something to reduce inflammation, I can't sell you the oil as an animal product. 
<laughs> but <laughs> we do have people in Ritzville that buy this oil, and I know they give it to their dogs. And <clears throat> we, have a, we have a lady that's a very good friend of ours that she took her, she took her dog to, to a vet, and the vet said, there's just not much we can do for this dog. He's really old, and there's, you know, unless you want to spend a bunch of money and do a variety of treatments, there's not much you can do. And the dog had really rough coat and dry, flaky skin and looked pretty scabby and, and kind of limped around because it had arthritis. And so my wife, not knowing all the FDA rules and USDA regulations, said, well, you know, our kids have bought or have gotten dogs from shelters before, rescue dogs, and they give them this oil, and it takes about 30 days, and the, the dogs really look nice. It cleans their hair coat up, and they have nice shiny hair and nice smooth skin, and they're really beautiful animals. You, you want to try some of this? So this lady bought some, and she gave it to her dog, and about two weeks later, she said, you know, that's a whole different dog. The, the, the coat is, is nice like it used to be, and it, we got rid of the dandruff, and it, it's not limping around like it used to, it, it, like it's feeling better. <clears throat> and so she's been on this program now for six weeks, and the, the dog's really looking pretty good. And so she decided to take it back to the vet. And she goes back to the vet, and she tells the vet what she, what she did, and the vet said, well, you might want to give it an aspirin also and send her home. So uh, <clears throat> the dog's doing fine. And if it does that for animals, I, I know it does that for humans too. So the omega-3s and the vitamin E in the soil are, are really uh, important for human health. So we included that uh, chart. The other chart we have is uh, uh, analysis from feed and uh, It's kind of an interesting chart. I, I was reading out there, and there was a nice poster out there or a research display about camelina meal fed to beef cattle. And uh, the camelina meal didn't fare as well as the other meals when fed to beef cattle. And some of that uh, is the glycophosphate or glycosulfates in the, in the meal because the plant's a brassica and it will have glycosulfates. Uh, and... Uh, that's, it takes a while for beef cattle to get on this protein or get on this meal and eat it. The palatability of it is, is not as good for beef cattle. But we have people that buy this for chickens, and the chickens do not have a palatability issue with it at all. Uh, we have people that buy it for lambs, and uh, the lambs, sheep and goats, and, and it, Goats will eat anything, I understand. But uh, sheep and goats tend to take to it a lot easier than beef cattle do. And I, that's just a palatability issue. Most of, our, most of our pellets, most of our meal will go to a poultry operation. That's running a natural, organic poultry operation, uh, or natural operation, I should say. Uh, we've also, uh, interestingly enough, we had an inquiry from a fish farm in Arizona, and we have shipped them some meal, and I talked to him this week, and he said that the fish, this is a meal, when it hits the water, it'll, it'll sink, and the tilapia and striped bass really liked it. And so uh, we're, he delivers to Seattle. We're looking into the possibility of, of selling meal to him and having him haul it to Arizona to feed uh, fish as a protein supplement. So... <clears throat> the other thing that we're doing now also, uh, besides the meal and the oil, is we sell seed. And uh, let me grab one of those. We sell this uh, bags of seed just like you would buy flax or uh, chia. We call this poor man's chia. We can sell this for about a third of chia and uh, be embarrassed how much money you make on a pound. The, uh, 
the qualities of this are not as high a protein as chia, and it's not as complete amino acid makeup as chia. We have more omega-3s than chia does, and more vitamin E than chia, so you're trading back and forth a little bit. Uh, this is a gelatinous seed, and gelatinous is a, become, it, it's from a fiber that's in the seed. It's a mucilage fiber, and this runs about 11% mucilage fiber, which is fairly high. And so it's, you take a tablespoon of seed, and you take two tables, is it two or three, Ty? Two? Two or three tablespoons of water, and you put it in a container, and you give it about 10 minutes, and it's a pudding. Uh, it's just a gel. Uh, people, vegetarians like that instead of an egg. They'll buy this and use it, uh, that instead of an egg. Uh, I will uh, wrap up with a story. Uh, we do a Kootenai County Farmer's Market in Coeur d'Alene, and uh, we were just talking about every, every, it seems like every market you go to, or uh, every time you're out in the public and you're selling an ag product, you always get, you always get some really interesting people. And uh, one day at the, at the Kootenai County Farmer's Market, I had this guy, uh, this was last year, he came up in a, in a green jump suit. I thought he was out of the 70s, maybe the 80s, but came up in a green jumpsuit and he had kind of a, a fuzzy curly hair and he uh, was looking around and he goes, oh, the seed. He says, uh, what's the seed for? And I said, well, it's a good way to get extra protein and fiber in your diet. And he goes, does it form a gel? And I said, yeah, it's, it's gelatinous, it'll form a gel. And he says, so it'll keep you regular. He says, I, I'm really, I gotta be regular. I said, I don't know, I don't guarantee those things with my product, but I said, if you wanna buy it, you can try it and come back and tell me. So <clears throat> he bought it, and a week later, uh, when we're back at the market, he's still wearing the same jumpsuit, and he walks by the booth, and he smiles, and he goes, it worked. <laughs> and, <clears throat> So, do, do you want questions now, or do we want to wait till we're done and do questions, or how do you guys want to do that? Sure. Where in Arizona are you shipping these? Uh, okay. Where in Arizona are we shipping the meal? <clears throat> we just started that, or we just tried that. It's just been a, an experiment. Uh, it is uh, a university of, it's not the University of Arizona, but it's, uh, is, two, is the University of Arizona in Tucson? Yeah. yeah, that's where we're shipping it. I always get those two mixed up. Yeah, it's a guy down there that's, uh, he runs, <laughs> he runs a striped, or he, not run, he's got striped bass and he's got tilapia. And then he's also got <laughs> the largest goat feedlot in the United States. So, goat, yeah. Where is it? Yeah, it's outside of Tucson, yeah. So. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, stores in Spokane that carry our oil. We're at, uh, well, our, the first store we ever got in was Pilgrim's in Coeur d'Alene. But the stores in Spokane are Main Market, uh, Rose Hours at the Y, Rose Hours at U City, uh, that Spokane Public Market, there's a booth in there called Fresh Crisp Produce that carries it. And then Rocket Market on the South Hill up by Manito, carry it. <clears throat> and the Main Market's kind of interesting. Uh, Main Market was one of our original stores and we kind of started there when they started, a little bit after they, they incorporated. Uh, and the manager told us recently that our oil now outsells olive oil at, uh, at Main Market, so, yeah, well, so. Right. You burn it. Right. 
Yeah, this is a, a 475 smoke point. So I, uh, <clears throat> my wife, about a year ago, she went out and, and bought a set of greenstone uh, porcelain, that stone porcelain skillets, and, and you're supposed to wipe it with an oil and then heat it till it smokes. <laughs> she couldn't get it to smoke with our oil. <laughs> so she had to go downtown and buy a bottle of olive oil to get the pan to smoke so it would seal it. So I thought that was kind of fun. But uh, you had a question? A couple of questions. One, do you take oil on a regular basis? Yes, I do. How much do you take? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you exactly what I do is, uh, <clears throat> you know, I got tired of taking statin drugs. And so about a year and a half ago, uh, a friend told me that, he said, do you ever realize that, you know, at first you start with a statin and then pretty soon you're doing blood pressure and then pretty soon you're doing a, a high, high blood sugar pills. And, uh, and that, that's kind of been my pattern anyway. And so I thought, well, gosh, you know, and I started reading about statins and I wasn't real impressed what they do to you. So I started taking two tablespoons of that a day and... Uh, it, it really did help me, my cholesterol. I, I have, I'm now off my cholesterol medicine. And I'll give you a website to go to. It's a, they do quite a bit of research on this oil in Europe. There's not much done in the U.S. Uh, but you can just uh, type in a search that's uh, cholesterol study camelina oil. And it'll take you to a university in, I believe it's Denmark, uh, and there'll be, there'll be a couple articles there, and they show they did a study with camelina oil, olive oil, and canola oil. And all of them lowered cholesterol. This one lowered it uh, by the most, simply because it's got more omega-3s in it. Uh, Are you aware of Andy's Market in college? Yeah, we're in Andy's Market. Good. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Money. The question is: Is this a family business, and what would it take to get us to the next level of being, you know, larger, more industrialized? Well, we're kind of working on that, but we're, you know, it's. This really started, it was really my, my two sons, it was their idea. They started this, and Dad, I had already retired from teaching, and I think they were jealous that I got to go fishing when I wanted to. And so they said, we're not going to let him sit around and do that. So, uh, so we're, we all do this, uh, my wife, uh, myself, and uh, the daughter-in-laws, and the, you know, everybody does this. We... Uh, we buy these bottles out of California. We ship them to Auburn where they get silk screened. Uh, we don't label. We used to stick the label on, but the labeler broke down and whined a lot. So we let my wife off the hook and she doesn't have to label anymore. Uh, and the silk screening honestly saves us money. Not that we paid her, but it does save us money. Uh, we fill them. We have a hand pump where we fill them by hand. And then we uh, put the caps on and do the, the green seal. So, uh, yeah, that's, there's some hand, uh, quite a bit, really, compared to other places. But you can, you can do quite a bit, honestly, in, a, uh, you know, if you're working on it, you can do quite a bit. What would take us to get to the next level? I think just more sales, large sales. Um, you know, we sell... Well, probably our, our biggest sale is like 10 cases at a time to a distributor. That's probably our biggest sale. We have a lot of individual uh, cases here and cases there and bottles. On, we have a store online. We sell there. And so, yeah. You're right. That's right. Well, we're capable of doing that. I mean, we're not that far. <clears throat> when you look at the, uh, uh, the press we have and the, if, you know, we're set up that we could add another press very quickly and we have enough seed and inventory to do all that. And, 
uh, enough capacity that we could do that, we'd have to get a bottler, but uh, you know, we're not that far away from, from stepping in and doing it, but you're right. And, and we have found, to be honest about those food shows, uh, you know, you can really lose a lot of money going to those food shows. And they'll promise you things that just aren't true. So, like how many people go through and stuff like that. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah, we have, we have some out in the car. I can sell if you want. Yeah. Yes, sir. If you go online and you start looking up any any animal product that's got a lot of vitamin E in it and omega threes, and they're advertised like that, because. Just what we talked about with the dog, you know, <clears throat> some of those dog products and horse products. And you can go online and look up uh, Omega Lena as an example. That's a product out of southern Idaho. Uh, it's 100% camelina oil is what it is. And it is sold, well, quite honestly, they sell it more per gallon for horse use than I sell it for human use. Uh, and the... I mean, it's out there. Uh, we talked to the FDA a long time before we really did this, so we wouldn't invest in something and do something and then have them shut us down so they knew exactly what we were doing. And we were told, you can sell it just like this, just the oil, but by God, you put a garlic clove in that oil and we'll shut you down because you're not selling garlic camelino oil. You're selling only camelino oil. But you can go online and buy camelino garlic oil from three farmers in Canada right across the border and have it shipped in. So it just doesn't make sense, you know, what they're doing. Uh, we have two inspections a year, one by the uh, uh, Washington State Department of Ag, the Human Food Division, and they come through and they're a pleasure to work with and they're, well, you're on, I'm on camera, I shouldn't say all this, but <laughs> <laughs> this... This, the, the human inspector, let me tell you, is a lot easier to deal with than the feed inspectors. And I always go, what in the world? I mean, I just don't understand it. But anyway, yeah, there's a lot of irregularities and hoops to jump through that shouldn't be there. And as soon as we get those hoops worked out, you know, it'll be a lot better. Thank you. Hi, my name's Kelly Cochran. I farm in the Colotus area, 35 miles north of Pasco. Our uh, rotation is a summer fallow wheat, winter wheat rotation, dry land all, 9 to 10 inches of rain per year. And um, for sake of time issues, is there anybody in here that's interested in, in getting started in this, in actually producing camelina? actually getting out there and going at it. What is the interest? So I'll, I'll tell you what I did to get started and, uh, and uh, maybe that'll uh, uh, tickle some thoughts. I have to be careful what I say also because it's on camera and our uh, Conservation Service District representative is here and Steve Camp is here who knows more than I do about how to market it. Uh, one thing that Kurt did not talk about is the primary um, use of camelina is to fuel. So that's why it was developed. And uh, uh, Steve Camp back there can give a little more information on that. But um, the reason I got started in it is because I'm looking for a, another crop to complement my summer fallow rotation in the dryland area. And uh, also, um, I'm taking out most of the land that I've had in CRP in the last 10, 15, 20 years, and I'm looking for something other than wheat to go to follow the CRP uh, takeout because of uh, problems we've had with take all disease when we put it back in wheat. And I've been doing this for the last three years now. Four, this is the fourth crop where I've put in camelina behind CRP and uh, take CRP takeout, and it's worked well as a, as a rotation. I got interested in this for a couple of reasons. Uh, 
Also, my kids were the first ones that were primarily involved with this. I'm looking for something, I was looking for something that my kids would be interested in doing other than growing wheat on the, the family farm. I want my kids to come back and farm. So I, I'm looking for things outside the box that interest my kids. So my youngest son well, thought, well, why don't we try Camelina? So we went up and we visited Steve Camp and we did some research and, and I've uh, sold product to Kurt Greenwald and I know the guys that are involved with this and just to see the feasibility. But I didn't want to spend a lot of money doing it. We run uh, hillside combines and uh, uh, we, we modified our equipment in such a way that there wouldn't be a big investment into producing the Camelina. I didn't want to go broke. There's no reason to go broke trying to prove a point of sustainability because if, if, if you're broke trying to, trying to create a different crop, then you're not in, in business anyway, so what did you gain? So the first thing that we were looking for was some way to keep my kids involved and not go broke. So I, I thought, well, how do, you, how do you go about doing that without investing a lot of equipment? I use John Deere 455 minimum till drills and uh, uh, seven and a half inch spacings. And I, uh, it's the same, same equipment I use for my wheat, for my spring wheat. I, I, I'm not gonna go out and buy equipment to grow camelina uh, that I can't use on my wheat, for my wheat. So my goal is not to go broke, but yet look into a different crop. That's where I am right now. And uh, what I've done is uh, very minimal adjustment, very minimal adaption of my combine. I have an old 1982 John Deere 6622 hillside combine that I wasn't using. And I'm going, okay, that thing runs fine. It just isn't as high of capacity as my other combines. What's the, what's the problem with maybe converting it to a Camelina uh, combine? And I, and I did it, and the cost for converting it, if I take out uh, the cost of the labor of a very expensive guy sitting in the front row here that I didn't know was going to be here today, uh, was pretty cheap. It was the cost of basically some screen that I got at the local hardware store. And I think Kurt can attest that my, my, my product was very, very clean. And I think Steve can attest that my product the year before was very, very dirty. And in one year, I, I figured, okay, I'm not reinventing the wheel. How do you, how do you, how do you do this process? So I had a friend in Tushi who was an alfalfa seed grower, and his name's Bob Willoughby, and great guy, he helps me out during harvest of my wheat, and we got to thinking about it, and we said, well, why don't we just approach this from the standpoint of what would an alfalfa seed grower do with his equipment to get, so that he could grow uh, uh, alfalfa for seed and not go broke doing it. And so we adapted my comb, it worked great. So in one year, we we went with from very dirty to very clean just from looking around and, and, and thinking about what you're actually trying to do. You're not trying to invent the wheel. If you're doing that, you'll go broke. You can't do it. <laughs> so my sermon, I guess, this morning in the five to ten minute capsule that I was told to talk is uh, you can produce this without going broke using existing equipment that is available out there on most uh, farms. I don't, I don't think you can make money at it on 10 acres, um, but uh, you can do it if you have the existing equipment for farming already. Um, so the question then becomes, you grow this stuff, what do you do with it? because there's only so much that Kirk can take. If everybody's growing this stuff, there's gotta be another outlet for it, which is fuel. My long-term vision of this is, as canola becomes more and more available and uh, uh, production is 
channel towards the processors. It's my understanding, and maybe again there's other people in this room that can answer this better than I can. It's my understanding that if you can press out canola, you can press out camelina. Is that correct, Steve? So the existing infrastructure is there for this product, um, which actually is a little different than canola in its end result for fuel and that type thing. And there's not enough time to talk about all that here this morning, but I would like to just put out there for you guys that are interested that this is an alternative to um, the monoculture growing of wheat uh, that's out there that um, is one more tool that you have to accomplish weed control, accomplish uh, fuel access, accomplish the uh, ability to um, bre basically break up the cycle of the problems that you have from a constant wheat rotation. I, I don't know anything about it under circle. I can't tell, any, tell you anything about the irrigation process of it, but I can tell you that I'm going to continue to do this because it looks good. Uh, it's too early to tell how it's going to be in the long run, but uh, I encourage people to uh, keep looking outside the box. Don't, don't get into this concept that it's, that it's a, that Camelina production or anything else for that matter is, is uh, a waste of your time. You don't want to. You don't want to put all your cookies in the Camelina pot right now. There, no way. But you can take this time of year and do some different things. For instance, I seeded my Camelina a week ago on frozen ground, and that sounds crazy, but it works for me. And there's a lot of things like that that you can do to spread out your time as a farmer, as a producer so that you can actually make your, your farm more, more uh, time and cost effective. And I'd be glad to talk to anybody about that, those, the type of things that I've done. It's just, you can't do it in five minutes. Um, questions? Yes? Are you doing this after summer fallow or after your wheat crop? Is, is this I've done all. I, I, I've done. We don't generally recrop in the Clotus area because of lack of moisture. It's dry. Nine to ten. Oh yeah. Okay. It's just just by Lower Monumental Dam up sure. 35 miles north of here. We don't have the rainfall to do that. We can't. Depend on who you ask. I, I hate to say we can't. We aren't very successful at direct seeding because of that critical point of of moisture that we do not have. Uh, did I answer your question? So, so are you planning it after battle then, or after wheat? I am experimenting with all aspects of it. Let's say, let's my winter wheat crop that's growing right now, I take it off in uh, July. In uh, November, I'm, early November, I'll be, I'll, I'll chisel it. I'll chisel that ground and maybe take a rotary hoe over it to smooth it out. I'll let it sit there. Uh, at the end of December, early January, I'll get out my John Deere 455 drills. I'll take the tubes out of the boots, let them just hang there like you'd seed CRP. I put in camelina seed at the rate of one pound of camelina seed and three pounds of, of, uh, of uh, solid fertilizer, depending on, you know, it might be 16, 16, 16 just whatever is cheap. I use that as a carrier to, to get it out of my tubes. And I put on about five to 10 pounds of camelina seed per acre, and I just spread it out on the ground, frozen. Because of the coat of the, of the camelina, it sticks on the ground. Steve told me to, to, uh, to uh, plant my camelina a quarter inch above the ground. So, <laughs> That's what I do. And, and so anyway, that's what I'll do for that rotation. Now another field, depending on, on the year, maybe this year with the drought, might be different. But I, I wanna experiment in the long run. I was telling uh, Scott earlier, in the end, I'd like to find out what rotation works best. For instance, a spring, spring, winter wheat, camelina, 
like a four year rotation and do a direct till. That way I'm not direct seeding every year expecting a winter wheat pro uh, crop out of it. So I do not have that, that system down, but I, I'm, I'm gonna try it all. Don't know, ask me in four years. Any other questions? Oh, it depends on if you're buying it like Kurt buys it from me for 25 cents a pound and then he puts it in a little bag and he sells it for $7 a pound. <laughs> so if you're going to see... Yeah. Am I wrong? <laughs> uh, seed per pound. I, I got my seed from Curtis Jennings or Curtis uh, Henning out of Ritzville, and I believe, gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, I, I think I paid a dollar and a half, but yeah. But what, I, what I'm going to do is after I've, I've developed this, this cleaning process right in my combine, uh, doing some, some different screens, and I've got, I have some really cool stuff that didn't cost any money, really cool. I'm thinking about using my own seed, which so I guess 25 cents a pound. So if you if I do my own, there's no treatment on it, but if I do my own, adding in the cost of the uh, the uh, fertilizer, I, I'd like to keep the cost per acre down below ten dollars an acre for um, seed. Somebody back there. Five to ten pounds of actual seed. Uh, I can't set my drills low enough to get that low with this stuff. It's like, it's mustard seed. So I, I cut it with three pounds of, of dry fertilizer per pound. So, I, so I'm putting on five to 10 pounds, but I, my drills are actually set at 30, 35 pounds. Does that make sense? I mean, I, we play with it a little bit. How do you blend that in the drill? Yep, yep. And, and it's not very scientific, but as Lester can tell you, he's the guy that helped cut it or he watched it, it comes out pretty, pretty even. Would, would you agree? Yeah. I, I'm, for, I'm for not losing money on this product. That's, that's any other, you, you're, I don't, you're speaking, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, you. In a drought year following a winter wheat pro, uh, um, crop, this this last year, I got 650 pounds per acre. Doesn't sound like a lot, but I'm looking at it as a rotation. I got rid of some weeds that I wanted to get rid of, so it's a value add. You know, it's a it's a great question. I want I want more than that. My, I would like to get 1,200. I, I think Steve gets 1,500 up in the cross area. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Tim Danaher. I'm from uh, Whitman County. Uh, I farm uh, southwest of St. John to east of Colfax. So we cover from 16 to uh, 22 inches. And I've uh, been growing um, yellow mustard since uh, about 2002 or 2003. Uh, prior to that, I raised uh, spring canola in the late 90s uh, for Curtis Hennings. And uh, the prices dropped and uh, I had to go back to some chem follow and I didn't enjoy that. Uh, I did a little resurrection of my lentil and pea program and then we had a wet fall and uh, Finally got done with lentils in October, and the next March, my wife said, well, you can have lentils or you can be married. <laughs> so, just to jab her back, I said, well, let me put a pencil to that. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, they used to say marriage is grand, but divorce is 100 grand, so. <laughs> um, so, I, I was introduced to, um, yellow mustard by uh, fellows at Genesee Union at that time. And I was looking for, uh, I was moving into uh, less tillage uh, and 
got involved with these guys. Um, it's principally three-year rotations, winter wheat, spring grains, and, uh, and yellow mustard. And I raised it uh, principally in the uh, 20 and 22 inch rainfall areas, uh, down the draws, up the hills, everywhere. Um, I have raised it out in the 18 inch area right around St. John, but it's, you have to kind of, I have to select the parcels I put it on, I don't put it everywhere. Usually the uh, clean, weed free, pretty weed free flats. Um, in fact, my best yield ever uh, was at St. John. I got 1,850 pounds. And uh, then I recropped wheat back on that and had a tremendous wheat crop. But everything fell into place. Uh, I usually, I've ranged down to 700 pounds in a, in a bad year. But usually we're around 1,000 to 12, 1,250. This year it was in the 1130 to 1150 range. Uh, we were at 30, Galen was at 35, 37 cents this year, I think. Yeah. Um, in, uh, in general terms, uh, the yellow mustard could be grown uh, in areas of eight inches of rainfall and up. Um, expected uh, average seed yields. Uh, gen you know, there's kind of a general rule if everything is hits perfect. Um, you get about 95 pounds of production per inch of rain. Now, as we all know, um, there are always other agronomic influences on that. Um, studies in Idaho have revealed though, which one of the things I looked at was um, nutrient recycling. And studies that I've read, conducted in Idaho, uh, say that over 50% of the moisture taken up by spring, by yellow mustard, comes from below five feet. So there's, it's pulling up a lot of nitrates that have leached away from the other crops. One of the things, uh, if you're interested, how many people here have raised yellow mustard? Okay. One of the things uh, that you must be aware of is what kind of chemicals did you use in uh, prior seasons for different crops? And one thing you really have to be careful of is uh, if you've had legumes like I used to have, uh, the use of pursuit herbicide, uh, labels say you've got to wait uh, 60 months before you can raise a, uh, an oil seed like yellow mustard. So what we did, we went out very scientifically and just dug up a bunch of earth and threw some seeds in it, brought it inside. And, and that's how we, because I was a little sketchy on some, I think I had some that are like 50 months away, but it worked out, so. Um, there's, there's not a lot of uh, weed control options with yellow mustard. So you really have to be careful to avoid uh, weedy uh, fields. You have bad infestations. One of the worst is, uh, is uh, catchweed bed straw. Uh, it's really tough to get out of a yellow mustard sample because it it has uh, about the same seed size and the same density and you can take a pretty good discount if you've got bed straw seed mixed in with your crop. Um, also volunteer uh, GMO uh, canola. Uh, if you've had any of that in the past and you have volunteer in your mustard seed, there's no tolerance for that in uh, in mustard. On the uh, grass weed side, um, the only thing I've ever done some spot control for is uh, wild oats. And there's a darn good uh, 
grass herbicide called Select. And, but I've only put it in uh, some areas where I knew the oats tend to be pretty, pretty tough, and boy, it cleans it right out. But if you've got a few oats here and there, I don't even worry about it. I just, it'll outcompete almost anything, so. We always, uh, well, not always. The last few years I've done uh, the soil tests, soil sampling prior to uh, seeding. Uh, in the beginning, I didn't. I thought, well, we're, you know, the, some, uh, some is good and more is so much better. And I was fertilizing my yellow mustard like my DNS. And I, was, I had a heck of a stand, but it was all vegetative growth. So the field man said, just dial it back. So I'm down to um, usually 65 to 70 pounds of N is, is all I put on. Um, but we go pretty close to uh, recommendations. Uh, after you run through uh, the nutrient management model, uh, there's different ways to look at it, different ways I've found in the literature. One way is two or three pounds of N per bushel of yellow mustard. Yellow mustard's, what, 56, 58 pounds per bushel. Uh, I usually put on only 12, 15 pounds of FOSS because uh, usually I have a pretty good uh, uh, FOSS level anyway from my other crops and 10 pounds of sulfur. Uh, seeding, seed it as early as you can. Now you're gonna have frost problems but, uh, and I've lost a little bit. Usually that happens around the, the creek banks. It'll frost off and you'll lose. Yeah, it's noticeable, you lose some, but uh, in the end, your production is so much better. My problem is I've got all this other stuff I've got to get in and they all say, you know, get it in early, get it in early. Okay, okay. Uh, growing period for yellow mustard is 85 to 90 days versus 90 to 110 for spring canola. I use, uh, I have used three different brands of drills. All double disc, uh, international 5100s, uh, John Deere 450s with press wheels, and I now use a, a Great Plains minimum till drill with press wheels. Um, you could just take the seed chart and throw that out the window because you get recommendations for canola. So what I finally came down to, and I use this no matter what color of the drill, close, close your uh, seed cup completely up, your flute, so it's just flush. And then open that thing up just the width of one seed. And I'm getting about seven or eight pounds, which is what I want to, right where I want to be. I swear, and I've done this just to prove it to myself, but I've closed my drills completely up, and I can still see them. So, I mean, it is tiny. Um, seed depth, half to an inch. Uh, in lighter soils, to get to moisture, you can go maybe an inch and a half, but boy, no more than that. Um, like I say, the herbicides were virtually nothing, insecticides virtually nothing because apparently nothing can stand this plant. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day and I can remember in the early days, my neighbor had, must have been peas or something across the road. And uh, he was talking about, well, we gotta spray, you know, because the army worms are just thick. And uh, so I, for the heck of a walked out in my, uh, stand where that's another thing it's pretty hard to walk through but you get out in there and I was finding army worms on the ground not a lot of them but I found three or four and uh, the glucosinolates and whatever biochemistries involved there it's uh, pretty repulsive to to many creatures 
Um, yeah, I remember the, the years I grew canola, spraying once always for in, insects, sometimes twice. Now harvest time, uh, it's a very slow process. It'll get, oh, generally about 45, 48 inches high. Um, if it's leaning away from you on the combine or it's to, a, to an angle, you can go along pretty good two and a half miles an hour. Uh, if it's coming at you, you got problems because it wants to ride right up over the auger, underneath the reel and over the back of the header. Um, as far as internal settings on the combine, just uh, slow it down and open it up. Um, cylinder about 400, wind about seven. Um, concaves are open, sieves are closed. And uh, one thing I learned this year, and this is the first time I'd had this problem we got rain in September, and it shut us down. And uh, you re to step back a little bit, the pods on a mustard uh, pod, yellow mustard pod, are pretty tight, and they don't shatter easily like uh, canola. I've had them shatter in a really severe windstorm just up on the ridge, but normally very tight which is really good except when it rains a lot the pods will dry but the seeds won't dry they'll somehow get the moisture in there but they, they won't let it dry out so i learned this year the maximum amount of moisture allowed to store to harvest it and store it in the elevator was just eight percent and there was I've got two neighbors down in my area that I think we were driving Galen Davies of McKay Seed crazy about, you know, we got to get this cut. And he said, it'll be all right, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. So, uh, yeah, you need to, need to harvest it less than 10%, but you can't store it for any amount of time uh, over 8%. So... Uh, Dr. Jack Brown has called it a walk-away crop, and I totally agree. Um, the rotational benefits, the natural um, fumigant aspects of it, the long taproot. Uh, we leave enough, quite a bit of stubble. We've no-tilled into it. We've two-passed into it. I've you know, I drove by some on the way down here, and I've still got stubble like that. It's a great snow fence. Um, like I say, we use it in three-year rotation. We seed it usually into preceding uh, spring stubble, uh, no-till it, a lot of two-pass. Uh, I'm very, uh, very pleased with my experiences with yellow mustard. Uh, the thing is we get, say, 12, 11, 1,200 pounds, sometimes 14, but 35 cents a pound, okay? But we don't have any inputs. Fertilizer's minimal. Herbicides are almost non-existent. Insecticides, no problem. It doesn't shatter. So anyway, it's been a a good experience, and McKay Seed's been great to work with. So. It's lunchtime. Yeah? Do deer or elk bother? Uh, no. Elk? There's a question. There is um, never been a problem with elk. The deer love it because they can hide in it that when they with the fawns. Um, pheasants love it. The hawks can't get them. But no, no uh, depredation. 
Okay?